Good morning. Um, uh, hopefully you can hear me in chat today. If I see um, Victor Stinner, you've already you've already sent a good morning message. Uh, maybe if you can hear me all right, once send a hi. Um, yeah. So uh, for you, maybe I did an intro as to me a bit more last week. So I'm not going to bother jumping into too much for that this week. If you want to go hear a bit more about me, maybe go watch my first stream from last week. Um, Maybe just a, a sort of quick summary again as to what we're doing here. Um, the goal is really to build the community around Pio3 a bit. Uh, you know, I've been working on this for a few years now, and there's quite a lot of engagement. Uh, most of that's mostly been, uh, virtual, well, you know, text-based over GitHub um, as people are growing adoption. There's obviously software out there that's using it, Polars, Pydantic, Cryptography, loads and loads of Python packages are picking this up with a lot of interest and excitement now. Um, fantastic. I, I hear, hear some good um, confirmation that we're hearing me, so that's great. Um, and yeah, so really it's about you know getting a bit more direct feedback from viewers. I want to get people interested in what the, you know building Pyro 3 actually looks like under the hood. It's kind of a nice excuse to, to show what's going on there. Um, my, I thought you know I could do some blog writing, I could do um, I guess just more general summary of what's going on in some form, but uh, ultimately, I don't have a huge amount of time as an open source developer. So the goal really is that by streaming this, I can kind of do bits um, of Pyo3 maintenance and development while also engaging the rest of the community. There was actually a really nice comment um, in reply to my Twitter post yesterday. Somebody said, like, uh, it's basically one giant pair programming session. Yeah, if, if these turn into gigantic pair programming sessions on Pyo3's code base, then that makes me incredibly happy. So uh, yeah, let's let's aim for that. Um, so a bit more context about this morning. I see we've got at least two um, CPython core devs in the chat already, which is very, very exciting. So welcome, um, Victor and Pet. Um, so what's going on? Um, for, for some context of uh, what my stream's about, I put a little bit in the description, but maybe a bit more. Uh, I'll try and bring up a web browser, actually, as well, because I think that might help uh, document a bit more what we're up to. So let's see if I can... Get OBS to do this right. Um, hmm, uh, <laughs> I'm almost certainly going to pull up the wrong window now when I try this, but we'll, we'll give it a shot. Uh, what have we got? Uh, oh, crap. Sorry about this. I'm still getting used to how to do this all with OBS. Right, so we've got that one. Um, yeah, that should be fine. Um, Okay, so if we go to, where should we look? Uh, oh, <laughs> I should have brought this issue up before I started the stream, actually. I, I was a bit short on time this morning. So do we remember where this would have been? Uh, there was a working group. Oh gosh, what's it called? <laughs> Oh, it's pronounced Peter in English. Thank you. Um, this isn't helpful uh, for everybody. Maybe discuss.python.org. We can find it there. Where is a good place? Victor, have you got any links to your proposals to basically thin down uh, the, uh, the private API for Python 3.13? I really should have brought this up before stream. I'm sorry. Uh, with a, I've got a two-year-old, and getting um, my family sorted this morning took a bit longer than I expected, so things were a little bit rushed. Uh, yeah, this is kind of this is a good a good post uh, that Victor brought up. So the idea was um, that Victor is uh, and Peter together, Peter have been working. Uh, for a long time on the C API, as far as I know, uh, and really like with the goal of getting to a point where, as much as possible, we have what's called a stable API for C Python. And the purpose before we start looking at code of the stable API is that it's compatible across lots of Python versions. So if you have used Python software like NumPy or Pandas or any one of those. Well, Rust packages as well are out there, which have um, native components compiled for them, then they always have to go through this great long life cycle of getting updated to the next C Python version every time we've got a release out. And that's because of changes that happen at the like, API and ABI level 
in the, in the FFI. And we'll, we'll look at some code in, at the moment in a bit to like explain what that really means. Um, but then the goal that um, Peter and Victor have been working on is trying to thin out that level of unstable API so that as much as possible we can get to a world where really everyone is building against a stable Python API that's guaranteed to be forwards compatible so that as soon as Python 3.13 or 3.14 or 3.15 or however far we want to go into the future drops, then we've got um, like one, one binary wheel that's just compiled and we'll just install on all of those future versions as well. And so, yeah, Victor proposed middle of last year to basically go through and do a large cleanup of what we call these private API functions to remove them from the CPython code. And maybe uh, a good point to look at next is we'll go have a look at what that kind of looks like in my understanding of, uh, oh gosh, that's not uh, gone where I wanted it to. Uh, yeah, we'll go look at some of the CPython source code here. Uh, so this is the core, uh, for, for those not familiar, uh, this is the, the repository on GitHub where the C, the Python interpreter itself is hosted, specifically the, the C Python interpreter, which is the reference and standard implementation that I guess like 90% plus of use cases must be using. Um, I forgot to mention earlier, by the way, if anyone has uh, got any questions as we go, just please type them freely in chat and I'll try and explain as um as the questions come in like this stream is meant to be inclusive for everyone who's watching and so if there's stuff that i'm going too fast or i'm skipping over particular details like please point them out or call them out and i'll stop and answer those questions um but yeah so how, how does this look for me uh as a as a user i guess of the c python interpreter uh if, if you're not familiar with c code it's split it generally into two sets of files so you'll have what you call header files which tend to finish with this .h uh, file extension. And they contain really the definitions that other C code can refer to and use. And then you'll also have uh, what we have uh, with .c extensions, which are more like the implementations. And you can't refer, like include the definitions from .c files directly in other files. But those header files, are really what define your API in C code bases. And so here in the CPython repository, it's a fairly standard convention for C projects that your header headers all go in an include directory. Include because you literally include the, these text files in your own code um, through a C pro instruction to basically get the API that you want. Um, and it used to be that all of this was in one great glorious uh, I think flat folder structure a few Python versions ago. And I think it was around Python 3.9. Um, Victor might be able to correct me that um, Victor did some work to basically split this up into a much more organized structure of uh, basically everything in this folder, the top level include, which is the public API for Python. And then inside there's the CPython, which is what we call uh, the private API, which is kind of this gray area that Victor's working to clear up, where historically a lot of projects have used APIs from here. Um, and then there's an internal API, which is specifically for when the Python interpreter is building itself. So you don't really ever want to use these internal APIs. And it's, you know, this is purely implementation detail. But if we go look at an example of, let's start by looking up uh, maybe object.h, which is uh, the definition of Python objects at the CE level. And so I don't really want to talk through the C code in too much detail, but you can see that uh, there's some structure, uh, C structures that are defined here. Um, Pi object must be defined somewhere else actually. I haven't taught this too much in advance of the stream. Um, and then we've got functions like, uh, oh, these are type defs. Here we go. This is a good example. So if you're uh, trying to call the equivalent of Python's repr function from C, then in, instead you have this C API function to do it, py object repr, where you pass a reference to a Python object and you'll get a new Python object back, which is the result of calling repr. So quite literally, uh, if we were to write some class uh, uh, with 
with a wrapper function in it. Then if we created if we create that class, you can see that the wrapper that it's drawing is high, just the string high. And inside uh um Okay, yeah. So Victor's correcting me saying it started even earlier than 3.9. Um and, it, and Eric Snow was even the predecessor to Victor on beginning that work. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, with regards to wrapper, this pi object wrapper function is part of the public C API. So that's probably, um, well, it's also jump actually to the Python documentation. Uh, and if we just search for pi object wrapper, we should be able to get to it. Yeah. And so what we can see in the in the, the documentation on CPython for PyObject Wrapper is pretty much what I'd expect to see. It's telling us that same uh, C function signature. It's got the doc string, which I think has actually come straight from the C header. If we flip back, oh no, it's come from somewhere else. Um, and it's also most importantly, it says part of the stable ABI. And so that means, as we've been talking about, that it's guaranteed to exist in this form forwards compatibly for pretty much every Python version, at least probably until Python 4. I guess the, the goal really isn't to break the stable, stable API, ABI unless there's a really, really good reason to, because um, if for those who remember the Python 2 to 3 transition, I think there's a lot of like community, uh, is angst the right word? Or, you know, people are ready, ready to grumble about it should there be another difficult transition in the Python community. So, um, I guess it, the, the goal really for the core devs is to keep this as stable as we can. So um, that's an example of a stable API function. Let's go back into the headers and jump back into the equivalences. In this CPython directory, there's actually another file, again called object.h, and this has stuff which is uh, in this gray area where it's version specific features. It could change from Python 3.12 to 3.13 it's not really clear how much code might break if those changes were made. And, um, and so we, it's kind of, it's a bit hard for the, the core devs to make progress with fun stuff in this, in these folders. And, and the goal really is that we want, uh, they want to get to a point where the stuff in this folder, I guess, is either removed or is just, uh, understood to be, uh, unstable. And so it's, if you choose to use this, you're, you're in a point where you, you will have to make changes to your code between versions quite likely. And so what sort of functions have we got in here that are interesting to look at? Um, hmm. There's nothing that, uh, that jumps out to me as uh, particularly easy to follow. Um, maybe, maybe this one, which looks fairly, fairly straightforward to understand. PyType get dict. So I'm going to guess that that's probably similar to this operation in the Python interpreter. I guess there's reasons that this is specialized. Um, and maybe because it's quite a straightforward operation, there's no need for it to be in, in the stable ABI at the moment. Um, I don't know the history of this function. I've just picked it up because it, it looks like something that I could guess at what it might be doing. But really the answer is, is that if it's not, if it's in these folders, um, Oftentimes it's not documented. Sometimes there is documentation for it. So if we scroll down this, we might see a function that's not clearly showing it's in the stable ABI. Uh, oh, here we go. So here's one, pi object get item data. So this is not talking about being past the stable ABI. So we can probably find it in this file. Yeah, here it is. And so we do have documentation on it. Uh, not all of these functions that are in this folder have documentation. Uh, they exist for performance or for historical reasons or other reasons that maybe I don't have the history to. Maybe sometimes it's because they're in a kind of preview state and they might be added to the... <laughs> okay, so Victor's saying that these are... They're generally, if they've not got the underscore prefix, which we're quite familiar with in Python as being a private prefix, then the goal is for these to be well-supported and stable. Okay, 
um, maybe I'm being a little, <laughs> little pessimistic about the number of breaking changes that might go on. But yes, so pi object guess, guess item data. If I had to guess, probably what's happened is it's new in version 3.12. Maybe for um, discussions on the review, it was decided that there could be other ways to do this, or maybe there are ways that this might want to be replaced in the future. So at the moment, it's not been added to the stable ABI, but because um, we can see, for example, pi type get data size was both new in 3.12 and added straight to the stable ABI. But this didn't happen for get item data for whatever reason. But maybe it will. Um, anyway, so the goal for today's stream, as far as PyO3 goes, is we're going to take a look and kind of audit. Uh, well, we'll look at how PyO3 interacts with all of these files. And uh, we'll audit which ones of these private APIs we, we think we're using so that we can give this feedback back to Victor and Peter so that um, for Python 3.13, where they're doing this great cleanup of what's going on in these fol uh, folders, um, they've got a bit more feedback on what PyO3 needs. And hopefully this will go one of two way ways. Either um, Peter and Victor have got great ideas about how we can potentially get rid of some of those usages, or um, alternatively, maybe it will lead to some of these APIs being added to the stable API. Um, Oh, I see. Peter's talking about um, the pi type get dict or wherever we were looking, and so right. Okay, so there's protections in the Python operation for this which don't exist uh, with the C API that we we spotted earlier, wherever it's gone. Um, okay, so I think having given like a bit of context for what we've got as far as the C API for C Python is going. Uh, what I'd like to do now is jump over to how PyO3 interacts with this and uh, give you a tour of how that goes, uh, and we'll keep looking from there. So if you've got any questions related to this, um, please drop them into chat as we go. Otherwise, let's switch back maybe to VS Code now, and I'll look at the code directly in the PyO3 repository. Okay, it uh, looks like I've managed the OBS transition better this time. Um, okay. Oh, I had feedback last week that the text size was a bit small for the stream, so I've brought it a bit bigger. It means that I'm not going to have as much space to show code on screen, but hopefully it's much more legible. So if you think that the text size needs a bit of adjustment, then please let me know. Otherwise, I'll keep going like this. Uh, so let's see what PyO3 has. Uh, I was looking at some tests, and actually let's uh, just check. I'm still on the branch from last stream. Let's switch back to main so that we've got everything as you'll see it on the Pi 3 GitHub at the moment. Uh, the most important crate that we're looking at from Pi 3s perspective, uh, for, you, for those of you who aren't familiar with Rust so much, a crate is uh, kind of like the point that you can split code up in Rust and have it compile into individual units. So they're kind of, they're the level of what you'll upload as packages kind to crates.io. The equivalent of PyP, and for different reasons, PyO3 needs to split itself up into a few different crates, particularly PyO3 FFI, which contains these FFI definitions. And actually, it, you can see that what we've tried to do is organize these to match uh, the same file names that we saw on the CPython repository just now. And similarly, we've got the CPython subdirectory with the same kind of file names again. Um, this is handwritten, <laughs> which might surprise some of you. Uh, the justification for it, I think, is both a historical but also a practicality. Um, first off, from history, uh, the Pi 3 dates from, well, the original code, I think, here was written maybe 2017 or so, and Rust tooling has come a long way since then. There's obviously been a lot of maintenance to this code since it was originally built, but basically it started as handwritten, and we haven't had a reason to get rid of this yet. But also, it being handwritten allows us to very deliberately match the structure that we've got in the Python uh, C API, which kind of helps with maintenance because we can compare what's going on. We try and keep the order of all symbols the same. But it also allows us to be quite deliberate about how we map things because we want to make sure structures are described correctly. Um, I'm trying to look for a good example of uh, this, probably uh, PyHeap type get members, which we've described here as a, an inline function, might well have been implemented as a, a C macro 
And by having it implemented in this way, it kind of works as close to a macro as we can get on the Rust side of things. Um, we could have used a Rust macro, but they work a bit differently to C macros. I don't really want to talk about why, but we felt that having these inline functions is a much more faithful representation of what's going on on the C side. Um, and so, yeah, tools exist that could like automate these binding generations these days. Uh, the downsides of those is that we'd need to have uh, Python C headers available at build time or commit the generated code into the repository perhaps there's like different approaches um and so i i wouldn't i won't pretend and say that there's probably some room for improvement here uh if you want to do more uh work or would be interested in doing some code on pio 3s repository then playing around with either just helping us maintain these definitions or even uh exploring ways to automate the generation of them would be really really cool we have um, another crate, which we don't actually publish, but which is part of the repository called pi 3 ffi check. And in this, I don't really want to talk about how it works right now, but I use that crate in the pi 3 ci to check at least that the structure definitions match for all of the Python versions. And that is quite important for the safety of uh, interaction with the C interpreter, because if the structure definitions are wrong, then we're going to be reading invalid memory, which is what you never really want to be doing. Um, uh, ever, <laughs> irrespective of whether you're working in C or Rust. And so here we've got, yeah, you can see we have definitions. So whether it's working on Python 3.11, um, all of these private APIs that live in the C Python subdirectory, if we go back to Py3 FFI, we have, um, I'm looking for C Python subdirectory somewhere in here. Oh, here it is. Um, so these are all gated behind this configuration. Um, in Rust syntax, what's going on here is that this is what we call conditional compilation. Um, and so the, this uh, CFG attribute is basically taking some kind of settings. There's loads of different build setting combinations that could be applied in here to evaluate, but they're normally kind of text or symbol based. And so we have said that um, you, if we're building for the, the Python limited API, then that is historically, I think, more akin to what the stable API was called, actually. I think if we jump back to the browser, we even see the term Py limited API somewhere in... I'll just go confirm that and then bring it up if I see it. Um, yeah, so let's go... I'll just show this quickly on the browser again. So we're at the bottom of uh, just the, the, the public API object.h, and you can see that uh, there's this protection here, which says that if the Python limited, we're not building for the Python limited API, uh, then we will also include all of the unstable or private API functionality as well. Um, this is quite a common pattern to basically include a header file just once in C. Um, but it's protected by this Py limited API macro. And we've deliberately tried to kind of match that in the way that we're working on the Py03 Rust side, because it, it helps to make it more, more direct to the comparison again. And that's the sort of thing where um, automated generation of all these bindings would, it might be a bit harder to kind of represent all of that nuance, but um, it might be possible. It's certainly like, you know, for the right person, there could be quite a lot of investment that could be put into these to make it closer to match maybe a bit more solid um okay so yeah and then the goal really for today then is to have a look through the pi3 code base and see where we've ended up using these private pi limit or not pi limited api functionality pieces and kind of justify either why or have a think about how we could replace them and ultimately we should end up with a list which we can then pass back to um, peter and victor um, so that they've got some feedback on where we're going next so I have two good ways that I can think of to go and audit how all these things exist. If you've got a better idea than this, then please like just comment it and suggest it. Basically, my options that I can think of is either I could just completely disable all these, um, and then we could go and see what fails to compile, and that will give us a good signal, or we could uh, search for this pi-limited API symbol 
and have a look through the Pi3 code. We've got 375 matches. We can probably exclude Pi3 FFI for now. So it brings it down to 268. Um, oh, we can probably exclude the guide as well because we don't need the documentation. 260. So there's still quite a lot <laughs> to, to have a look through. I'm not sure what the best way is. I might start just having a look um, going down this this set of results and then if if somebody's got a, a better way that we can have a look through this then that's definitely welcome uh I'm just give me one second i'm gonna have a quick sip of coffee right okay so um what hits have we got rid of pi prefix tape first um we can have a look. Um, the challenge here is that searching for just underscore pi. Oh, we've hit a. Uh, oh, we don't need to worry about that. Oh, maybe it's not too bad. Seventy-five results. Okay, let let's start with this one then, um, Peter. Um, that's a good idea. So. Uh, discounting the change log and the readme what have we got um okay so this is just an underscore for uh pi c function fast which was the definition for maybe it's going to be helpful actually if i bring up uh on the side a browser let me try and play around with this sorry everybody of this oh <laughs> i've still got the browser up sorry <laughs> obs failed if it looks like i'm showing the wrong thing on stream please do just like shout out because i'm pretty sure that i'm gonna make errors like that um i what well, i thought i might try uh oh, um i'm gonna have to resize the browser to achieve that is if i put the browser over here then maybe we can have some reference material up at the same time as we look through the Pi3 source code. Does that seem a sensible arrangement for people if I bring up the documentation here at the same time? Or I might also need the code actually as well um, so that we can take a look at what's going on. Uh, yeah, okay, so we've got, the, we've got code on the right for Pi3 and we've got some documentation and source code for CPython on the left. Let's go with that. If it looks like a confusing arrangement for everybody, I can possibly switch it around again. But as you've noticed, I'm not a master of OBS yet. <laughs> right. Um, so back to what we're looking at. So the first match we got is this definition pi c function fast, which um, we talked a little about a bit about these method defs last week. Uh, they're how when you're creating a Python type, then you need to have a uh, a list of the method well you can produce a list of the method defs which contain uh, c function pointers to all of the method implementations and pi3 tries to wrap that a little bit um in particular what we've got here uh oh is it going to be helpful to have maybe we're going to run out of screen space somehow but we'll tr okay we'll just go for this for now so this function uh pi c function fast is going to live how are we going to not lose this search does anyone know a way to keep the results of a vs code search while we search for something else at the same time um oh maybe we can do it like this no nope. that's only going to go for the current symbol ah here we go that's better. So this was added in Python 3.10, this PyC function fast. And the idea is, is that it's a different uh, calling convention, if I remember correctly. So when you're creating these Python methods, then uh, historically what would have happened is it works a bit like Python, where if you've got args and quags, uh, it's passed as a tuple and a dictionary. But uh, there, we've had this fast call convention introduced at the C layer, and that tries to avoid having to produce this um, args and quags as a tuple and a dictionary and goes for a slightly more efficient format. I don't really want to look at why, but we do actually use this 
um, in Pi 3 around the place. I'd be surprised if this is still unstable. Maybe it is. Um, it could just be that we've not updated the symbol. No, it doesn't exist there. Um, I think if we search for type objects, we should get it. Here we are. Yeah. So we talked about these pi method def structures and how we need to produce a list of them uh, to, or a sequence of them for describing the methods on a type. And uh, they have some flags on each of these methods talking about how the, the, the pointer that contains the function should basically be interpreted. Um, and so the default one maybe is uh, meth varags or meth keywords, which would be more typical of your, um, oops, that's going to be a tuple in a dictionary, which we've got the, uh, the definition for. The, those are all documented here. And then meth fast call which, oh, is past the stable ABI as from Python 3.10. Ah, which is exactly what it's saying here on the, uh, on the right-hand side, that either, um, because it's any, we're on Python 3.10, or for versions before 3.10, then it's not part of the stable API. So this, this definition actually, underscore pi c function fast, is stable, but it's just got uh, an, an underscored pi name. So... Uh, maybe Victor, Victor or Peter, is, this, is there a reason that this continues to have underscore or is it just a historical thing and maybe if we wanted to we could uh, improve this and have maybe a typed F to alias it to a, a non-underscored prefix? Um, I'll leave that as a question, but either way, it looks like Pisces function fast is okay to keep for, for the moment. Um, we've got pi initialize main. Um, that's the next one that we can jump onto then. So that's just a documentation link. Um, ah, because we can, as part of Py3, we do allow you to, um, we talk mostly about uh, Python modules, and extension modules, which are implemented in Rust, but you can go the other way around and you can embed the Python interpreter in your Rust binary. And if you do that, then you're going to need APIs to basically start up the Python interpreter. And these are things like py initialize. Um, oh, I, I'm just going to collect this list as we go, just before I forget. So the next thing, symbol we found is py, C, py initialize main. Now, if I um, recall rightly, actually, py initialize main uh, let's try and find the code in Py3 where this is going to be used. Uh, it's probably... It's in here. Leading underscore is private. If you use it open. Uh, let's see Python issue. Find add a public alternative. Okay, right. So we probably... Uh, Py C function fast just as a, a type def even could probably benefit from being made public then given that... Uh, it sounds like meth fast call is part of the stable ABI, and it's probably just the the, the fact that the type def for the function pointer type is not is maybe an oversight. Okay, um, so if you're embedding a Python interpreter inside of a Rust binary, then the only API that Py3 has currently got for this is this one prepare three free threaded Python. Um, I don't know the name for it is not <laughs> maybe the best. Um, it's a really long, old historical name, uh, which dates from before Python 3.7, I think it was, where um, Py initialized threads was a separate API. And basically, you could choose whether or not to import threading is ba at startup, basically, is more or less what, what I think it used to be. But um, we haven't bothered to rename this symbol. But really, these days, all of the API um, I guess, Victor, you're talking about PyC function fast. We, we can take a look at that, I guess, off stream later. Um, so yeah, uh, and so yeah, free-threaded Python is probably misleading as a name these days. Actually, um, so all we do is we call py initialize ex, 
uh, which is just the standard C API. This is definitely public to uh, basically launch an embedded in Python interpreter, but this is also kind of outdated now. So in Python 3.8, we can actually bring this up. Um, there was a, a new way to, or to initialize the Python interpreter. Here we are. Um, called pi initialize from config, which took a lot more uh, controls. 3.8, 3.9. Um, there's a lot about it. If um, there was there was a pep about this as well, so if anyone has a link to that pep, uh, then that'd be helpful. But anyway, um, this initialize from config is currently uh, part of the private API that I'm fairly sure on, um, and it's available I think on three point eight plus. Pi 3 currently at the moment still supports 3.7 because there's a large long tail of, I believe it's Amazon Linux, uh, probably EC2 hosts out there that are still using 3.7. And so we still support it. But I think once we drop 3.7, then we would be looking towards adopting this Pi initialized from config API instead, which um, I know is private at the moment, but I think actually, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Victor submitted a PEP very recently, uh, yeah, a week ago, to basically make um, this initialization API public. Uh, oh yeah, and there's there's the PEP for the old one, PEP 587 uh, was 3.8. So I'll just uh, put that in chat. So uh, there's basically a more flexible way to start up the Python interpreter, which I'm look I think we will adopt in Pi 3 soon, but that's gated behind uh, the private API, which is sort of fine for uh, embedding a, a Python binary, like or the Python interpreter. Like it, it, the difference in the distribution models, I think, is quite key to point out here, because when you're building a Python extension module that you're going to upload to PyP and it's going to be pulled by other people running whatever Python interpreter they like, then there's a lot, har lot harder questions about compatibility with different Python versions than if you are distributing a Rust binary that happens to embed the Python interpreter, you've got a lot more control about which Python interpreter it's likely to be run with. And so the fact that this API is private probably matters less. Um, but despite that, it's it's clearly a case where we're still trying to elaborate on what should be private and public and so i don't i haven't actually vector i'm sorry had the chance to read through this pep yet in any great detail but as you can see a week ago victor has added a proposal for python 3.13 to make this an initialization from config actually part of the stable api as well and so there it's making it public it's taking it out of that gray area i guess where we're trying to determine what might change or might not change between python versions so this is definitely a positive change too. Um, I guess we don't need to worry about pi initialize main for the moment on our list because Victor has already got that under control. Um, so let's go back to a VS code and have a look at what we found next. Ah, okay. Um, so maybe we can pull up the um, documentation here. <laughs> sure thing, Victor. I'll I'll um I'll try to read the pep and talk a little bit more about how uh they, it would benefit PyO3 to to make that API public. Um, so what we've hit next is we've hit this symbol PyLong from byte array, and actually there's three kind of that I'm going to talk about as a pair: PyLong as byte array and PyLong num bits. Um, so first off, like what, what's going on here? Let's try and describe it on a high level. We've got some documentation here. Just make this a bit smaller, a preamble at the top. Uh, for those of you who've looked at the integer types in Rust, you would probably be familiar with the fact that they're all sized 
to specific numbers of bits. And so you might be treating with I64, for example, or um, which is 64 bits. And so it's got a certain capacity that it can reach. Or I think the largest one that's currently part of the Rust standard is I128, if I've got that right. Um, but either way, if you want to go beyond that, then you need to start doing something more like what Python has, where it can dynamically, dynamically grow its integers um, size at runtime to basically, I don't know what the upper limit of a Rust of a Python integer is, but it, it's much, much larger. And that's because basically it can record in some form the digits as a list of digits. I think they might be encoded in some binary scale. I'm not too sure on the details in the Python side. And so you can get much, much bigger than 64-bit numbers. And so Pi3 by default, we obviously include the conversions to all the standard Rust integer types. But um, the Rust ecosystem has crates which allow you to go beyond those limitations and do something much more akin to the Python integers. And one of these is um, what we call the numbigint crate. And so Pi3 has a feature that you can enable. Uh, actually, let's bring it up on the this left-hand browser. Um, so on the Pi3 user guide, we have a section about the features that we contain, and um, it's just got a very short and sweet one-line description. But basically, you can enable this feature when you're using your Pi3 code. There's a bit of documentation here that shows you how to do that. Um, you can see that if we go to the Pi3 documentation, you search numbigint you should get this same documentation, but rendered. And there's not really any functions explained here or listed here. It's just giving you a little bit of detail about how to use the conversion. But the idea is, is that by enabling this feature, then you can start writing uh, Rust functions. Um, we talked a little bit about this Py function and Py methods, um, procedural macros to make Rust functions exposed to Python last week. I don't want to go into that right now. Um, but you can then use the big int type as a an argument or a return value, and PyO3 can handle that conversion for you. That was a bit of a digression, but I think it sets up to why we've ended up using these uh, underscored APIs. And that's because, um, so PyLong is the old name for a Python integer. For any of you that used Python 2, I think I've got my memory right here. It used to be that you had two integer types, int and long, and um, there was some nuance about when you were overflowing an int, I think it might have automatically created a long. But either way, integers were much more fixed size and the longs were these, these dynamically sized ones. Um, if I've got my memory right. If anyone remembers differently, please correct me there. Uh, I, I'm sure that I hit that in the past, but uh, it could be just a, an artifact of bad remembering. Um, but yeah, so in, in the C API, uh, Python 3 got rid of that old int type and only has long, but calls it int now. And so the C API still contains uh, the long name because it's more difficult to rename things. Uh, well, I guess the Python 2 to 3 transition went through a bit of that churn, but uh, in the C API, we didn't make those changes. And so it's still called PyLong and probably the ship sailed to make those changes. So it will always be referred to as PyLong in the C API for now. And in particular, uh, if we go to, we can probably look at the definitions that we've got in PyO3's FFI crate for this. We can see we've got conversions to, these are different sizes of um, C integers. So C long, C unsized long, size T, and these can all be mapped back to different Rust sizes as well. I don't want to enumerate them too much, but as far as I'm aware, if we want to get to the variable sizes of uh, Python integers, then we need to start using unstable APIs to do this. So pylong num bits, pylong from byte array, and pylong as byte array. And so uh, I am not sure that there's really a better way to do this. Um, we could possibly call, um, you know, if we let's bring up the terminal again, just for a moment to show what the equivalent of this would be in uh, Python's setup. I think, so let's make some really large number, perhaps. Then I think, is it two bytes, the method we're looking at? Isn't too big to convert.
I'm a bit surprised that we get an overflow error there. Um, I thought that we could convert arbitrarily sized integers to bytes. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, okay, right. So the constraint is that you need to tell it how many bytes you're prepared to have when you're you're creating this thing. Um, and then there's a function in bit count. So we can use this. It says it needs to be 58. So I guess uh, what's the ne next multiple? It's going to be 64 is the next multiple of eight. Yes. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> It looks like there might be some chat latency. I don't know if it's going any faster for you. Yes, X to bytes 100. I've, I've been corrected by the core devs, of course. And I just got there from the docs, which are, as usual, very, very good. Um, but <laughs> the core devs have just beat me to it. Um, so X to bytes. Um, so I guess we can do eight should be sufficient in this case. No. Maybe we need 64. OK, so it's a bit count rather than the bytes count there. Maybe I. I'm a little bit surprised by that. Um, or I've got my math wrong. Anyway, um, so here we go. So we've translated this uh, Python integer into a series of bytes. And so there is a Python API that we can do this with. And so if we go back to uh, PyO3, then um, where's the implementation that we were looking at? We were looking here. Um, we call uh, uh, PyLong as byte array we're currently looking at which is kind of achieving the same thing, but from a C API level. So we're taking uh, the Python in integer. Uh, we're passing it as a Py object pointer, I think, because that's what the method wants. Uh, we're, we're giving it a location to the, the bytes that we, we want written out. And these are, um, this is a C buffer now. It's just a pointer to, to bytes. So we're not going to create a Python bytes object here. And that's part of the efficiency win that we have here, right? Um, we talk about the number of uh, bytes that we're going to need, uh, the endianness. Uh, I don't want to really get into endianness right now, um, but basically it's about the order that the bytes are written into the buffer. Uh, and then whether we're going to allow for negative results, I think, is what this last uh, flag's for. But so we, we use this for performance reasons, right? Because the point being here that we can write directly into a series of bytes in memory rather than needing to make a new Python uh, bytes object. And actually, if we look here, this code is gated on not uh, the Py Python limited API again. If we're using the uh, limited API, then we do actually call uh, the, this code is um, we've got the Python long objects we should probably start calling this pyint in pyo3 but at the moment we still call it pylong like um, the c api um, and then we're going to call a method on it we call two bytes uh, we pass it some arguments so the number of bytes we want to get uh, and the endianness and we set up the signedness as a keyword argument i guess that's possibly because it's required to be passed as a keyword argument because i'm sure if we could pass it in the tuple, then it would be more efficient. So there must be a reason that we've had to set it up as a keyword argument. But so the conclusion here is that we already, when we're using the stable API, we are using uh, the two bytes method. But when we have the advantage of being able to build for version specific code, we can get a little performance win here by using PyLong as byte array. And so, and then similarly, I guess it will be the reverse for the uh, other direction, so from byte array. Um, yeah, so we call from bytes if we're if we're using the, the stable API. Calling the Python method is a supported way to do this. If you need the performance, let's add the supported C API to C Python. Yeah, so I think uh, let's. Well, what I think we'll do is we'll write this down for now. We'll document it. We'll say this is for performance reasons. And then if we've got some time towards the end of the stream, what might be interesting is to benchmark this and just sort of demonstrate what kind of results we're getting from doing this. Because uh, that would be a cool way to understand what the win actually is on making this exposed. And so we have got some benchmarks set up, but I kind of want to focus on the main task first, and then we'll see where we go. So. 
Uh, let's go back to our notes. So we have path. So we'll just call it that for now. The underscore prefix API is entirely supported. You shouldn't use it ever without PyLimited API. Uh, yes. So it's definitely, um, we always gate this, these calls on uh, not PyLimited API. So we, we're definitely making sure that we're, we're compliant with the version specificness of these APIs. But uh, if we think that this is probably something that we should be looking at either stabilizing or getting rid of, then yeah, I guess that's a good follow up for after the stream. Uh, so continuing down to the next result that we got, it's actually the same thing again uh, for 128 bits, because maybe on some platforms we couldn't get 128 bits without doing this as well. Uh, okay, let's just jump on past that then. Um, the next hit we've got is to do with... Um, the Pi Unicode compact data and Pi Unicode data. So uh, <laughs> what's Pi Unicode is probably a good first question. And it's actually very similar to uh, the, que the, the topic we just had about the difference between int and long and how that arose back in Python 2. And Pi Unicode is another one of those exact, uh, I guess, historical things where if you can remember back to Python 2, then there was two separate string types. There was stir and Unicode. And I can't remember how the conversion between them worked, but I think stir is much more similar to what we now call bytes. And Unicode became what we now call stir. And I think there's a little bit more nuance than that, but that might be a good way to at least start thinking about what they were. Um, so yeah, in the C API, we still call all operations on stir pi unicode uh, subtyped operations. So that's giving a context of what we're looking at. We're looking at APIs on strings here. And this is in some pi03 test code. So we're looking at um, interactions specifically about um, looking at how these uh, objects so well we create a pi string first off uh, we cast it to a pointer and then we're recasting it again as a pi ascii object and this is very much inside the c python unstable subdirectory it's a definition of one of the layouts of how python strings can be laid out in memory there's lots of these and it's probably a whole separate topic in itself so let's not jump too far into that detail but it looks like we're uh, checking that we can read some of the data out of that. Um, so ultimately, this is this is checking that our FFI de definitions are working as expected. It's a test inside the FFI submodule, um, and particularly, I think that the complexity here is arose because of. Um, well, first off, we're reading directly from the structure definitions inside the private version specific API. So there's already kind of a, a little warning light flashing, if you like, there. But we're going a bit further. There's a bit field. Um, what this is in C terminology is you can, you can have several fields all compressed into some larger field. And you can spe specify exactly how many bits you want each of those subfields to occupy. Um, so in turn fills two bits, kinds fills three. Um, hello, oh, um, compact fills one bit. Uh, there's 24 bits spare at the moment. Now this is um, problematic for lots of reasons. Uh, first off, I know that this uh, bit field has changed between different Python versions. And so we, we probably don't want to be reading from this bit field if we can avoid it directly. Um, and further, Rust doesn't actually support C bit fields. So I think from memory, there's a PR that we could go look back on when we add, added these APIs to read from this bit field. But I think we used the help of an automated binding tool to generate this code that was able to read it. I, I'm sort of scrolling through this. I don't really want to get into the weeds here. Um, 
but if I remember rightly why this API exists, what there is is um, this API this API in particular, uh, Py Unicode data, which takes uh, a Python, well, it says any Python object, but it really wants a Python string because uh, it's we've got a debug assertion here to check that it's a string. In release mode, we trust that you've given the right thing. Uh, but in debug mode, and I think this matches how CPython might do it, we're, we're confirming that you really have given a string. Um, this is probably a macro in the C definition. And then it's returning some untyped pointer. And that's because of the different layouts of how the, the Python data or string layout, string data might be stored. And then I think there's different sizes that the data can be stored at, like it can be stored at um, eight bits for, per character or maybe 32 bits per character, depending on the encoding. There's a lot of complexity here. Uh, if you're interested, I think probably worth going and reading into it. I think it's even somewhat documented on the Python um, probably called Unicode objects in the documentation. Uh, is this what I'm looking for? No. I'm looking for the documentation for the C API for strings because I th I'm fairly certain it covers all of this in some form. Let's just search for... I've got the capitalization wrong, I think, there. Oh, yeah. So there is documentation for uh, this direct access to the contents of the, the Python string. And there's all sorts of constraints. Yeah, this is... So I guess, Peter, this is a good one to talk about because it's it's been documented. And if I remember rightly, this was asked for by, um, I think it's Gregory Shores. I'm not sure how he's his name is spoken. He implemented PyOxidizer, um, which is a way to build a, a one of the tools that you can use to take a bunch of Python code and create a self-contained executable. And I think he wanted this API as a way to interact with Python strings before the Python interpreters fully initialized. There was a lot of dark magic going on there. Um, so probably we need to understand first what that use case really entailed. And then you're saying that this is a fully internal API. So I think we need to kind of figure out if this one's on the candidates for removal in Python 3.13, and if it is, what we should do to replace it. I think, uh, actually, Peter, um, you might remember that I think I sent a PR to CPython's repository some time ago to uh, make this not a bit field, and, and then there was good reasons not to change it like that in the in the source in the Unicode layout. Let's go back. Mm, where are we? Here we are. Yeah, so I think I sent a PR to propose that this didn't need to be a bit field, but you had good reasons why it needed to stay and why the other direction was to talk about APIs to correctly read from this thing. So I think that the the right approach here is to follow up with why pyoxidizer needed this api and look at how to get rid of it but uh, or at least how to replace it but i think the good news is that actually this py unicode data api is not directly used inside the pyo3 source code as far as i recall so this is only we've we've got it as an ffi definition so that other rust projects have been able to use it but if you are building a python extension module using Pyo3's standard safe APIs, then actually people aren't using this API. So th there's some solace there, even if uh, we've got more questions to answer. So let's write that down. Now, and then we can move on. Okay, so the next hit we've got is PyNewRef. Um, 
Oh, this one is actually, <laughs> it's not as bad as it looks. So we've ended up somewhere inside Pio3's machinery for creating operators like add. And I don't really want to talk about how this implementation is working. There's a lot of macro magic going on here that is itself probably worth a whole stream to look at and it'd be a very interesting one to talk about. But the point is, is that we've ended up uh, sometimes these operators, you want to uh, say that the operator is not yet implemented. And the correct way to do this in Python terminology is to return not implemented, but you need to return an owned reference to that type. So this helper pyneuref creates that. And I think, um, here we are, I've got my key bindings all sorted out now, that actually, uh, I wrote a document, a comment here as to what's going on. Um, these these uh, functions are macros that just call pi inc ref, which increases the reference count of the target object and then returns the object again. So they are a convenience and they just return the object straight back out. Um, pi inc ref is an operation about Python reference counting. This is a bit of a painful one. If you can see, there's been a few changes to how Python reference counting has worked over the time. And for performance reasons, it's kind of assumed that it's inlined into code, uh, not with a limited API. So there's lots of different code paths here, probably with no jill uh, in Python 3.13. I think that there might it might be moving towards its it's never inlined instead, and it's private to the Python interpreter. So this whole pyincref, pydecref definition might well change yet again. I don't really want to look at it too much, but let's go back to pyneuref. So this is a private symbol, pyneuref, but it's kind of harmless. <laughs> and uh, I even said that, you know, these were defined in C, C Python 3.10, but I wanted to use these in the Py03 code on any version because they're very straightforward. And then you can see that the Piney ref itself was defined from Py310. I think, however, though, we can probably tidy this up. So maybe let's look at that on stream right now. So we've got Piney ref, which is just basically doing an increment, uh, a reference count. And um, I, we, we talked last week about how Py3 is working on a new API to make these things uh, both efficient or well, make Pyo3's safe API, which we haven't looked at all here, more efficient, but also, uh, make, uh, well, efficiency and safe was the, the two goals. Uh, we You can look back at last week's stream, which talks about that in a lot more detail. I think, however, though, what we could do is we could replace this with some of the Pyo3 API. I think that this is, um, I not implemented if we've got uh, why can I not get to the symbol now? Control T. Oh, I'm looking wrong keybind. Um, Let's see if I can remember what I'm looking at. Oh yeah, here we are. So we actually have a, a safe API to do this. So probably what we should have done here is now replace this with um, a proper Py3 API to achieve the same result. So we're getting a pi not implemented object and we're pushing this into a pointer. And this I know from construction because the into pointer method always creates an owned pointer or an owned reference when it's it's being operate called being called. Um has the same result as what we did below. Um, but it's avoiding using the FFI layer and it should be completely equivalent in terms of performance. So I have no concern. We're just going through and tidying all of these up. So there's a nice example of how using Py3 safer API or safe API, um, which is the whole point of Rust, 
we can do this without having to operate on pointers except on the return type because the return type is expected to be a pointer but we're avoiding uh calling an unstable symbol at the same time so this seems like a good tidy up sorry we just got a few compile errors because i've started um if you're in rust if you're not using a function argument you can prefix it with an underscore and then the compiler won't complain that it's unused but we now started using all of these function arguments so we had to just take the underscores out okay so that looks like it compiles now and we've got rid of a, new, a use of new ref and i guess oh. <laughs> it turns out that into pointer itself we've implemented by uh pi new ref so maybe we can tidy this up at the same time. Hmm. And it's gone from a one liner to a three liner, but we've taken out again, the underscored pi new ref API. So that seems like it's probably uh, the correct change to make. And actually, this API is operating on the uh, PyAny reference type. Um, it's in this impl PyAny block. And this is, so th that function, where were we? That we were just modifying is taking uh, this reference PyAny and it's returning a raw pointer. That's and it's an owned Python reference that it's producing. Um, and actually, this reference to PyAny, if you watched last week's stream, that was something that we got rid of, or we're aiming to get rid of with Py 3.0.21. We're reworking this API a little bit anyway. So this one's going to get removed, is all I was going to note. Cool. So we've now tidied up a whole bunch of those Py new ref operations. That seems like a nice change. So we can push that at the end of the stream. Um, next, what have we got? We've got a PyC function fast with keywords. It's again, uh, we talked about PyC function fast before. Um, so we've just got another use of that. I'll group those two together. That's this is just in uh, some PyO3 definitions that are trying to just wrap these uh, C types with something a little bit safer. I don't think we want to dive into the details of that because we've already talked about that. Okay, next one. So now we're looking at, uh, we're in the file complex.rs. So Python has complex numbers. Um, there's a complex type in the Python standard library. You probably don't use this unless you're a mathematician or doing something uh, else that is going to require these complex numbers, but they exist. Um, there's C APIs to interact with them. And um i'm just trying to remember so this is just the we're, we're exposing this as a type in the uh in pi3 safer api and so in in the in this safe api we allow you to produce a complex object from two double two point uh floating point numbers we've also got uh you can get those two components back out the real and imaginary and then so we've got two operations which are private apparently we've got uh the absolute number or absolute value of a complex number it's a mathematical operation um you can look up the de definition of it it's relatively straightforward i think it's it's been a little while since i did maths it might be the square root of the sum of the squares um of the two components but somebody would probably correct me on that um the and then the power of the complex number so it's multi it's a, an operation to interact with these and this must be using pi c power so the two symbols we've found are pi c abs and pi c power 
uh, there's Pisces Sun, Pisces Diff, Pisces Prod. There's lots of these different operations on complex numbers. So I guess this is a, a question straight up to Victor and Peter that we might come back to. Um, we're using these API. We're exposing these operations on complex numbers. We've gated it on um, the private API. But these, as you say, they're, they're for underscored symbols. So, I mean, I assume that that hasn't changed. Sometimes we have a little bit of drift between what we define and what's in C Python. But if we go to complex H, we can probably see, yeah, that the only actual public API operations are getting the two components out, and then anything further is not defined. So I guess my question to you, Peter and Victor, is on these APIs, what's your opinion? Should we get rid of it? Should we... Okay, so there's uh, there's some some rethinking to do. I think what I'll do, as far as we're going with this stream, is we'll um, we'll just remember that PyO three has given people the ability to interact with those if they've opted into the the private API. But whether you want us to continue to do that or you want us to remove it or rework it, for the moment it's there um, and we can figure out if there's a, a cleanup. I I would certainly be open to deprecating it and then we could see if anyone uh, argues against that deprecation. Uh, I guess, do you know if you've already removed those in Python 3.13? Because I haven't looked at what you've done on main recently. Yes, I, I completely agree with that. But <laughs> sometimes it's been exposed because probably someone wanted this in the past, which is why it got added. But whether that means that we should continue to offer it is uh, open to interpretation. Oh, I'm, I'm really sorry. I've been looking at things in the browser again and still had the terminal up on the left. If it looks like I'm looking at a window, which you can't see on stream, please do shout. I'm not sure how long I've been looking at the browser window while um, you've been seeing the terminal. Um, if that's the case, please just drop a message in chat if it looks like I'm looking at something that you can't see. Uh, okay. So yeah, it looks like on, on CPython main, you've still got those. It looks like you put those back in because people gave you feedback, maybe. If we look at this commit. This is where you had to revert a bunch of things, yeah. So we can take them out of Py03 or at least deprecate them. And potentially we can, de I don't know whether you plan to deprecate or remove for Python 3.13 as well. We can look at doing that. So that's a good follow up. Yes, <laughs> I I know what you know you mean by that. If if things are if things are still present in in the API, then they could be being used. But is it a good thing if they're being used? Uh, Rust actually has quite nice mechanisms for deprecation, so we can maybe look at that in a second because uh, we haven't got too many of them, these to go through. And so we can definitely prepare a commit where we deprecate these methods and say that the intention is for PyA PyComplex to remove them. Okay, so next we've got uh, pi set next entry. So this is inside iteration of a set. Yeah, I agree with you. It probably feels like modifying the pi complex API is one of those things where um, it's not likely to have a super high uh, payoff in terms of like improvement for most code. And so the amount of time spent on it probably doesn't want to be that high, but at the same time, you don't want to get the whole Python interpreter bogged down purely because that API exists. So yeah, probably it makes sense to solve in some way, but whether to, I, I assume that again, in, rather than calling directly the C API, that users could call into Python methods to achieve that. 
and there might not be that significant an overhead in doing so because i presume that these apis are typically returning python integers anyway or python complex objects so maybe there's not a a huge motivation in terms of performance for keeping those around anyway so the next thing we're looking at is in set iteration we've been using this method pi set next entry and it might be i can't find this here oh, okay uh it's been moved in 3.13 into the internal API. So that looks like that's something that's going to currently cause a problem for PyO3. So I guess we need to talk about why that's being used. Uh, I think it's for iteration, right? And presumably at the time when it was used, we've got it. Yeah, we're using it in both frozen set and set iteration is what I see here. So this has been taken out. Uh, there are presumably performance reasons to do it, but I guess that the alternative is to just uh, basically do the equivalent of what you would do in Python, which is, uh, uh, let's just switch back to a terminal. I'll remember to do that this time. If you've got some set, then I, the, the Python way you iterate this thing, right, is to, to well, Basically, you end up creating a set iterator and then you call next on it uh, a bunch of times. And each time it will yield the next result. We'll need to save that. And then eventually it raises stop iteration. And so that is probably, if I was to guess, what you're wanting us to do for Python 3.13 and not to use this PySet next entry function. So fortunately, the good news is that this code is again gated on not being part of the limited API. And we do have, if I recall, a limited API version, which is just taking a normal iterator and calling next on it repeatedly to advance the iterator. So we have got an implementation which would be compatible for 3.13. Um, and I guess it would be an interesting question as to whether that matters for performance or not. So that's Pi set netto. Next entry. Ah, oh, we've got another call to Pi new ref. So we talked about this earlier. We can let's just get rid of this at the same time again, because the preference is to not use this symbol. Oh, well, actually, this is already a, a Pioneer reference. Um, so actually, there's really no reason for this to be using unsafe or FFI at all. We can just do it like that. So that, that's, that's better. Uh, this should be in the same boat. And then we've got uh, high initialized main. Ah, so this is jumping back to what we spoke about before earlier in the stream about how uh, the, the initialize APIs for Python 3.8 were uh, in the private API, but they might well be made public in 3.13 anyway. So we, we haven't done any updating for 3.13 yet in Py3, as you might have noticed. So we've talked about Py initialize main before. Okay, so that's at least gone through all of the underscore pi symbols and we've cleaned a few of them up so i guess victor and peter we could look at um the rest of the pi limited api code there could be quite a bit of it alternatively 
we could go and look at a bit of benchmarking for either these PyLong fast paths or the PySet fast paths and understand if what the performance difference is. Um, maybe if people in chat have got a preference, then can you maybe indicate and that will motiv that'll help me decide. So the choices are, um, is it, uh, do we want to do benchmark fast paths or, uh, okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks for joining Peter. Um, Uh, Lily, when doing that last interpointer change, did you introduce an error with ownership? Uh, it's a great question. Let's go back here. Uh, ah, yes, I did. <laughs> and you can see that there's a squiggly underneath. Um, that's because this isn't a reference, so it's not copy. So uh, what's a good way to get around this? I guess, I think actually that this might be, uh, if we look at, maybe let's talk a bit about PyRef mute. Uh, if we can find it. Is it? clone or anything um not at the moment i'm just refreshing my memory on what we've got and then i'll talk about it okay um we should probably make it there's 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 more to be added to this api i would say so what's pyref mute so the idea is that uh, if you are um, if you if you're exposing Rust types to Python, so let's jump over to uh, what we had we had this up on stream last week. We had a, a Python class that we'd created from Rust code, and we defined it as a we defined some methods on it. So we created some stuff. We were looking at class methods a bit more. Okay, we've got a vote for bench benchmarking fast paths. So unless people vote in other directions, we'll go for that next. Um, so we can build one of these things from, uh, from Rust this way. We were looking at class methods. We're not looking at that. So let's imagine that we have some data in this. And we wanted to just, let's just do it like that. And then we can also make it so that Pyo3 can, can read this thing. We can set it directly, but I kind of want to take the setter away and make it more obvious what's going on. Or we can even define that like this. Uh, so now if we compile this code, Have we got the terminal up on stream? Yeah, we do. Great. Um, so we talked about using oh, normally needed a virtual environment set up to use Maturin. We talked a little bit about all of this last week, so I don't want to go into super detail on Maturin. You can watch last week's stream. Um, asking Danger Code, what's the purpose of the benchmarking? So what we're talking about with the benchmarking is uh, that some APIs we looked at that we collected in this list as we were going through, uh, specifically related to integer handling and set iteration, are what uh, the CPython core devs term as uh, private APIs that they actually don't want anybody to be using. And so the question that we need to be able to answer for the core devs is, do these APIs mean enough for us uh, as Rust extension writers that we want these APIs to continue to exist? And if so, we're going to need to you know, write some justification and propose that these become stable. 
or uh, we need to show that these APIs don't really add meaningful performance improvements. And so then the, they're fine to be removed. And then it makes it the life simpler for C Python core devs. We can get rid of the these murky gray areas that we've got where the, these private APIs are being used when they probably shouldn't have been. And so uh, we're going to help make everybody feel a lot better if we can answer the question on whether these do matter for performance. And so we can run some benchmarks to explore that. Right. Uh, going back to the... Yeah, exactly. So we'll confer, we'll, we can, we can, I think there might even be a benchmark and we can look at playing around with that in a moment. Uh, I don't think I compared directly the limited API version using the generic iterator versus using PySet next entry. But um, we could definitely like play around with that benchmark and get the answer we want out. Uh, I'm just going to drink some coffee for a moment. So yeah, just before we jump to that, I was going to explain what we did wrong um, to create the ownership error here. And to do that, we need to talk very briefly about um, this uh, pyref mute type. And the context there really comes from here. So if we look at this code that we just wrote, we've got, um, we've defined this my class type from Rust. Um, and we've given it a field X, which is currently set to be zero. And Py3 set up machinery so that this is a Rust 32-bit integer, but you can read it from Python and you get obviously a Python int back. You've, you haven't got some weird other type coming out here. This is just literally when you interact from Python, you see an int. Um, and we've also defined a setter for this thing, which is, kind of looks a bit like how you might think of a property from Python. So you can type instead m.x equals five, and now if we were to look again, we see that X has changed. Um, and if you have done uh, some work with Rust references, you'll see here that we've got a mutable reference to the class type for a moment while we make that modification. And the question here is that Python is a, like, you've got multiple threads going on. You don't have control over how long uh, the, like this lifetime might be interacted with or like multiple threads might try and call this at the same time potentially you've got the global interpreter lock at the moment but all of these things uh, come into play basically like you can't uh check for some arbitrarily complex function that you could write here you know you could make some python call uh what's a good example i don't know let's just imagine that we made some Python call here. I can't think of a good way to <laughs> type this code out. Um, but we, we might end up in that imaginary Python call doing arbitrary Python stuff that might end up calling set X again. And if you have two calls that are both looking at this mutable reference at the same time, that's undefined behavior in Rust. So we need to somehow protect against that ever happening. And the way that that works under the hood is that really PyO3 is, has got this, like, if you've looked at RefCell in the Rust standard library, um, then we've got, um, that's not right, that's autopilot. It's a protected wrapper. PyO3 is a protected reference to cell. Um, it works like, so we've got refmute in, in the standard library um, from refcell. And so PyO3 at the moment has this concept, uh, pyrefmute, which has this pycell kind, kind of concept. And it works very similarly. It's in the internals of this pi class proc macro that it all gets set up. And the idea is, is that when you are interacting with Py these Rust objects from Python, we need to check that you haven't got multiple references that are mutable at the same time. And so we have that defense going on. And so Py3 should let this code compile in as well. I'm almost certain that this will work. 
If it doesn't, then it's a bug. Yeah, great, it works. And so really, when before we had um, the mutable reference, then PyO3 inside the machinery has produced one of these PyRef mutes to defend your access just long enough for this function to run. And so it, I, I'd have to like construct a deliberate example, but if you tried to call this set X where this Python call, um, did, if it ended up calling set X again, then we, we'd raise an error. I think it's a runtime error saying already borrowed. It's not the best error message, perhaps. We could improve that. But the point is, is that we won't let you get into what's termed Rust undefined behavior, where you've got two of these self-references living at the same time. And that's a bit of a digression. But the point is, is that in this test, we wrote it with PyRefMut. And so, and that's because we wanted to get access to the pointer here, but we've um, we transferred ownership, which is the problem that Lily demonstrated because this contains a pointer to the underlying Python object, basically. It's it's more the detail than I want to go into right now. So we'd originally had um, this using this Py new ref symbol, which we've been advised not to use anymore. So we're just going to, oh, hang on. We'll produce the pointer and we'll call um, FFI pi inc ref to increase the reference count de deliberately and do it like this instead. And so, sorry, that was a little bit of a, di a digression, but we now kind of answered that with a little bit of detail about the why and what's going on with this pi ref mute type. There's probably a, b a better, more detailed explanation we could do another time. Um, okay, cool. So let's just like wrap up by doing some benchmarking then, because that sounds like it's getting the most interest. So as a reminder, we had um, two sets that we could look at. The, the first off, there's integer conversion for big integers. And there's also the set iteration. I think the set inter iteration is a simpler one because there's just one API there, whereas there were three uh, in the cases for PyLong. So let's start with the set iteration. Um, we have some benchmarks in the Py3 repository. We can see these in a Py3 benches uh, subdirectory, which contains uh, different benchmarks that I've added over time, showing how performance goes as we're interacting with the Python interpreter. And there's um, actually already one here for set iteration conveniently. So we can start by looking at this, and then we can play around with it to get the answers we want out. Um, so what we what this benchmark's doing, and, and actually we, we need to be a little bit careful because we're also doing some mathematical operations here in summing this benchmark in this setup. So we're creating a set which has 100,000 elements in a range. So it'll be 0 to 99,999. Um, we are... It looks like we are creating it. We probably don't need this vector in there. Oh. This is probably going to work. Oh, it's just, it's a bit messier. So there, there was a vector just to get the right type into the I set new. I'm not going to play around with that right now, but we might look at that again in a minute. Um, PySet new might fail because we might run out of memory or the type, the contents might not be hashable, I think is the other possible risk. But here we're just unwrapping. Normally in library code, you'd want to handle the error properly with question marks and return results up. But in a benchmark or a test, this is kind of okay. Uh, we're going to sum up all of this. So we start from zero. Uh, this is the benchmark here, this call to b.iter, b is a bencher. It's coming from Criterion. And actually, we've got a wrapper around um, a, a continuous integration uh, online benchmarking tool called CodSpeed. We can go look at that, what that looks like in a minute, maybe, in the browser. Um, but we're calling this b.iter routine, and we're doing this. So we're going through the set, and we know that the contents of the set are numbers. So we're, we're getting them out of the set as numbers. They start as a, you can see maybe the hint here, 
is a piney. Why is that not? Uh, normally, if I double click, I'm sure that Rust Analyzer will fill that annotation in. Anyway, it's it's hinted at. You can see it. It's a, currently a piney. This is because this benchmark hasn't actually yet been updated to use the new PyO3 API. I actually think I have a PR up. Um, let's go look at that quickly. To change this over to the new PyO3 API. Yeah, so we talked a little bit about this last week. And so I don't really want to go into loads of detail, but we're changing PySet to use this new bound function instead. And you can see I've changed it to set to use it as well. Um, and it, it's just got slight performance implications, actually. Um, we can see that it's made set iteration 27% uh, faster is what the CodSpeed uh, continuous integration benchmark has measured this benchmark is changing by by modifying the Pi3 API in the way that I was talking about last week. So there's there's something to be won here <laughs> when we come to our next Pi3 version. Um, and actually, yeah, it, if you're interested in this, um, maybe go have a look at this pull request. It's uh, Pi3 pull 3743. Um, you could also, if you want, just have a review on it or ask questions. Certainly one of the things that's uh, making Pi3 not point 21 not be ready yet is purely just review energy we, like if you're interested in either helping implement or review these things then we can get it out faster so yeah if you're interested please do join that but yeah so we we've with the new api we're going to make this 27 percent faster thereabouts uh oh have i got the terminal open again <laughs> thank you thank you um yeah let me jump back so i've opened up uh the, the pull request on the browser um, I was mentioned CodSpeed, which is uh, it's a new uh, startup building a uh, continuous benchmarking tool. It's really cool, actually. So maybe we can just take a quick look at this while we're here. Um, and what it said is that for this benchmark, it is set, which I've changed to use this uh, new bound API instead. Then we end up just by all the, all the change is doing is changing to use new bound, which is the opting into the new Pi03 API that's coming. And we at the moment you just have to, you have to explicitly put dot iter on. Maybe we'll take that out again so you don't need to. But uh, by making just that change, that benchmark in in that code using the new Pi03 API, you're getting something that's 27% faster. So there's there's something to be won. <laughs> in Pi03 0.21. I'm sorry that I forgot to switch over to the browser again. I'll I'll get better at that as these streams go through. Um, great. So yeah, and what does CodSpeed show? If we just link up that, let's just see if it loads. Um, oh, it's taking a moment. Here we are. So we can see uh, a summary of all of the benchmarks. And we saw, I love this, by the way. This is really, really cool. Props to the CodSpeed team for building this. Uh, we can look at this iter set benchmark. We can see um, where the performance was in the original uh, implementation. And we can actually see if we look at what we've got instead. This is really um, what the change in the Pi3 API was getting rid of. I talked about this a lot last week. Um, in, the, in, the, in master, in the original benchmark, there's this huge block here, which is in the Pi3 framework. And we've completely gotten rid of that. And that's how we get the 27% speed up. It's a really nice win. Um, and if you've got more complicated operations going on, you can get more complicated flame graphs out. Um, it's all really cool to see these, these things. I don't know if there's one that's really complicated. Here's one with a little bit more in it. Uh, if you've got more, more code that's doing more involved things, you'll get more complicated flame graphs here, uh, from CodSpeed. It's really cool. This tool, we can talk more about that another time, perhaps. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm sure that those benchmarks are super tiny. Um, let's, I, I don't want to jump back onto that. If you go to the pull request yourself on the Pi3 repo, you should be able to click through and view that yourself, I think. Um, so please do go have a browse. It's really interesting to go see that stuff. But yeah, let's, let's focus on the, um, this iter set benchmark. So first off, we have, um, so we're summing up all of these integers. We're measuring the time it takes to do that. And if we switch back to the terminal, which I will remember to do this time. Yeah, 
love love for, love for cod speed for sure um if you want uh that you can go follow them and find them on i think probably twitter codspeed.io is the website uh, i've been really happy with my interactions with it um so let's yeah remember to switch back to the terminal this time how can we run this benchmark we can go yeah um so we talked a bit about nox um last week it's just a helper that or it, it's a python package which you can use to build like helper scripts it's really useful in the py3 ci we've got a bench job we can directly ask to run uh the set benchmarks and i think if i pass one more argument i can even tell it just to run the set iteration so i'll just scroll up again um we basically Nox is a, a command line interface to run uh, jobs that we want in the Py3 repository. We've got a, a Nox file which defines all of this. So we've got one called Bench, and it's basically just forwarding some instructions onto Cargo, but it's doing it with the right directory set up and a few other config things. So it's really convenient just to have. We use it a lot in the Py3 continuous integration. Uh, so that's going to run, and what we got is that this benchmark measured on my machine is taking uh, 932 microseconds. So what's that? Nearly a millisecond. Um, so let's just study this benchmark in a bit more detail. At the moment, I think we are running it with the private API. So that's uh, PySet um, next entry. And let's just write that down here for the moment. Why not? And I believe, I could be wrong here, that we can also pass as an extra instruction uh, just the feature we want to use. And in for historical reasons, Bio3 calls this feature to opt in to the stable API, the ABI3 feature. So it's a bit, a bit weird that, and that might be something that I'd like to change in the future actually, is that uh, by default, when you're working with Pio3, you get the whole private API. And there's an opt-in to build with the stable API. And maybe as that gap of what the stable API offers reduces, then there's good reasons to change it the other way around so that it becomes opt-out. Or I guess it would be opt-in to getting the state the private APIs, which seems a bit more consistent with how you'd normally think of Rust features where adding a feature adds stuff. But at the moment, adding the stable API or ABI3 feature takes away the private API. And that's a historical thing on Pio3 originally didn't have ABI3 support and it was added a couple of years ago, three years ago, maybe at this point. So I think if we run that, uh, oh, that's not worked. Um, none of the selected packages contain these features, ABI3. Oh, that's because we probably want to refer to it like that. Yeah, it's the Pio3 ABI3 feature we want. Okay. so. Uh, what I'm expecting to see here then is that this time when this benchmark runs, it's slower. Okay, so it's saying it's 10% slower. Um, thanks, thanks, Plashless. Appreciate the support. Um, so yeah, we got uh what's that so that's uh 1.04 so that's not that much worse in my opinion like i mean um just a quick question on pio3 um so plashless um pio3 is a a rust crate with a library which is used to connect Rust and Python together. So you can go either way with that. You can create uh, Python extensions which have a Rust implementation inside them, or you can create a Rust executable which embeds a Python interpreter so that you can let user-defined plugins or whatever use Python. Um, and there's a, there's a whole user guide out there. If you go to pio3.rs, you can have a getting started guide which gives a bit of an introduction. Um, I don't really want to go into more detail on that right now, but hopefully that's a good place to get started. 
Ah, just so that was the link pi 3 rs um, okay so 10 percent slower for not using the private api well i mean we just won 27 percent uh in pio 3 going in the other direction so maybe what we should do is also switch branches to to measure this with pio 3's new api so we've got um a bit more of a a sense of what what things might look like in the future as well is probably a good thing. So I'm just going to uh, I'll have to remember to upload these changes that we made already later because we made the changes to remove the unstable symbol piney ref. And then I'm going to check out what was the Bench called this one set bound constructors. Okay, uh, I'm going to have to reload that file because it changed. So, as promised, on this branch, we call this new bound API and we do the iteration instead, uh, but otherwise, it kind of works the same. So let's run those benchmarks again, first without the ABI3 opt-in. So this is running with the private API. So um, so we should hopefully see something that's about 27% faster on my local machine as well, though benchmarks can be finicky. There we go, we got, um, I guess this is probably measuring against the generic iteration. So it's not quite as much as 27% faster um on my machine but it's still demonstrating quite solidly that the the new api when we get to releasing pio3 uh, 0.21 is going to have performance improvements that you can come and opt into uh so let's just do that with the abi3 feature enabled again and this time uh this, this command line interface is from Criterion. Uh, so Criterion will now measure the difference from this number to the result here. So we're only 6.5% uh, slower. Uh, oh, hang on. I haven't written that very nicely, have I? I think it must be like that. So I think with that, we've probably got some data that we can take back to, the, to Peter and Victor. I'm not sure if I think Peter had to go. Victor might still be watching, but that's at least some numbers that we've got. We, by taking away that private API for set iteration, we're getting a slowdown of 7% in Rust extensions that would be trying to iterate uh, Rust or Python sets. So whether that matters, I guess, is for uh the core devs to decide but i'm sure that it it's unlike i think for uh, if i remember maybe dictionary iteration we have a public api for that so it's quite possible that this justifiable that we could add that um let's go add that to our notes that we got oh where have i got that here we are. Let's save this before we forget it as well. Uh, I'm in wrote the previous answer. If I'm using Python 3, I need to create Python libraries back by Rust. And not using any Python 3 API related to embedding Python is the binary size smaller. Um, so Amaruddin, the answer there is that yes. Um, Rust is only going to actually contain the symbols which you're actually using. So if so when you compile your uh, IO3 built crate or extension, then it's only actually going to include any of the PIO3 stuff that you ended up using in your own code. And then everything else is basically going to be stripped out. So it's not like Python, where if you're depending on Python libraries, then you're going to be pulling in 
all of their source code into your final application. Rust is going to be only including what you actually wanted. And so, yeah, there's no cost to Pio3 being able to support both directions as far as your final binary size goes. Um, okay, so the other one to look at was uh, these, well, actually, uh, yeah, let's look at these PyLong fast paths quickly. So if we go back to uh, where we were looking at this, uh, we've got PyLong from byte array and PyLong as byte array we had. And then there was another one, pylong num bits. And that was working out. So we had from and as, which were doing the conversions in and out of C, a series of bytes into a Python integer. And then we had pylong num bits, which is the helper there to work out how many bytes we need to allocate somewhere in our Rust um, data structures to contain that integer data. So there were three APIs in total, but we can benchmark all of those if we've got integer conversion benchmarks. And I think we do. Um, let me just look um, where we're looking. So probably, oh, it's probably bench big, isn't it? We're looking at big integer conversion. So that looks like the right thing. Uh, extract big int small. Ah, so we've done it with a few different sizes here. We've got small. We've got negative, and you can see we're creating very, very large uh, Python integers of different sizes. And huge negative, huge positive. So let's go back and run uh, those benchmarks. So that's in bench big int now. And I might just let this whole benchmark suite run, and then we can have a see what we get. So it's going to take a little while to run all these benchmarks because we've got, uh, what was it, six of them? Yeah, we can see six of them on the Criterion uh, benchmark setup here. Uh, if you've not used Criterion, it's a Rust library that you can use to do benchmarking. The, the, the reason it exists is, or we well, particularly we use it in Pio3, is that uh, Cargo has a Cargo bench instruction, but it's only available for nightly Rust uh, because the, the way to set up uh, benchmarks is basically still a, a nightly Rust API. I think there's um, recently been some activity to start looking at making that kind of thing stable again, but I think it's still some way off before uh, Rust benchmarks are part of stable Rust. But you can still run Cargo Bench as long as you're prepared to supply your own, I guess, benchmarking library. And so Crit Criterion is the one that we use in Pio3 to achieve that. There are some other choices out there. I think um, might be an, an older one called Bencher. And then I think there's also one called Divan. Um, I think they're all good options. I haven't got a strong preference. Criterion is the one that Pio3 picked in the past, and there hasn't been enough momentum to need to change it. Um, OK, so we've got our benchmarks finished running. and. I don't think we need to worry too much about what these numbers say. There's quite a few of them, though. I'm just going to copy them out into our notes here for the moment. So I guess we want, let's just take the name of them and how long they took for the moment. Uh, <laughs> getting this stuff programmatically, I'm sure there's a way to do it. Uh, I remember in the past doing a big Pio3 benchmark run, and I asked uh, ChatGPT 3.5 maybe to see if it could organize all of this output into something reasonable for me in, in a table. It didn't do a great job of it, to be honest. Um, <laughs> maybe with ChatGPT 4 it could have been better, and maybe that would have, maybe uh, I should have just done that now. But for the moment, we'll just write these down. We can think about these numbers in a second. Uh, and more in, oh, actually, why don't we finish copying this? And then we can just run this again with the Pio3, ABI3 feature enabled. 
And so this is So we'll get some more data points here and see what this performance difference looks like. I think once we've got these performance numbers, then we've kind of come to a two hour point, which is pretty much where I think my energy levels are running out. Uh, my thoughts on Copilot's performance. I'm not an, uh, uh, a Copilot. Um, Copilot I quite like actually. It's certainly not super accurate all the time, but it, it allows me to hit tab and then amend a lot of stuff. Um, it certainly speeds me up. Um, do you think there's any changes on the life cycle of nightly features in the last, say, six months? Uh, the fact that features can tonight with no quite idea is where they'll end up. Um, I think that uh, the thing about nightly Rust features is that it's heavily dependent on who is available to champion and put implementation effort into them. Uh, you know, the, the Rust language team has got a lot that they're trying to expand on. Rust is a big language and there's a lot of stuff which they're actively working on all the time. So I think if there's a perception that stuff's not moving, it's only because uh, it's functionality which people are currently not able to prioritize. Like um, there's lots of good ideas out there and if we added everything to Rust tomorrow, then maybe in one sense the language would grow too fast too quickly, but also like um, it might be that it ends up being in too big a language and not, not well refined. So I think they're right to move like with caution and take their time to, to build it correctly. Uh, I don't feel like Rust's pace of development is problematic personally. Like I feel like new stuff is coming and I hear of people working on on bits and pieces. So I I think it's entirely possible that you know stuff that got implemented in the past is then not a priority and just languages like languages for years, but you can also have stuff that gets uh, implemented and stabilized quite quickly just because that made sense. So yeah, nightly Rust is every feature has its own speed that it delivers at. It's not like added to nightly and then six months later it stabilizes. It's really a a case by case question. So it's not a huge surprise to see that uh, going through the pure Python APIs for these methods is significantly slower. Um, and that's because we've got, um, I'm gonna have to copy these same things again. The okay, so well, fa failing is fine because that's just passing the wrong data type and detecting the wrong data type. It looks like it's not any different. Please excuse me, I've got <laughs> a toddler arriving home. Uh, I might have to wrap up before too long, depending on how he's getting on. So what do we get? The, the, the detecting the wrong data type takes no different time. That's really like, I think it's probably if we look at that benchmark, uh, it's passing a dictionary and trying to convert it to an integer. So that's going to fail quite quickly and that didn't change. So that's not a huge surprise. Um, getting even a small number out has taken, well, more than eight times as long. Um, getting a, a bigger number out is three times slower. So, I mean, it's still quite a bit more performance intensive um, or over, uh, overhead intensive, I guess I should say. So there's, there's reasons to want those APIs, I think. Unlike in the set iteration case where maybe 7% slower isn't a huge deal in the grand scheme of things, and it's, it's really down to what the, the core developers feel is appropriate in terms of the complexity of the Python API against um, the performance that is available. Uh, personally, I, th I think that maybe there's a more compelling argument here that uh, for huge numbers, you're just doubling the, the length of time. I guess that's because the python -y overheads go down relative to everything else. But for small numbers, then you're looking at you know, if there's code that's converting a lot of these small numbers, um, maybe if they're out, if they're under the size of a C data type, then maybe you don't go down this pathway anyway, but still you could look at um, quite a significant overhead if you were. And maybe 
for these big numbers, certainly you're looking at three times slower. So if you're dealing with a lot of integers, well, may maybe it's a problem that, I mean, maybe a counter argument is that there are things like polars and pandas out there and numpy, right? Where uh, you're looking at things in a, a numerical data frame or array anyway, and they have very different mathematical performance to, or new, well, performance that's much more optimized compared to just going through Python integers anyway. So maybe there's a debate that this isn't necessary, but certainly we've shown that there is a bit more of a performance pro uh, difference by taking these private APIs away. So I guess that's kind of a, a good point to start wrapping up. Before I sign off, has anyone got any further questions or comments on how, how this went? Um, do you have things that you'd like to see in future as a follow-up? Um, Carol, um, I hope to be at PyCon, yes. So I have submitted a talk proposal on, um, I think I was going to go into one particular piece of PyO3 in a little bit of detail, uh, trying to talk, go, show, show it from the, the Python side. Um, I have, I think the PyCon talk proposal uh, submission results come back in a couple of weeks. So I, I hope that my talk is accepted, but obviously at this point, I don't know. Um, <laughs> this isn't me trying to like pull arms or anything. It's a, you know, we'll see what people think is interesting and what fits the PyCon schedule. But uh, I guess more generally, the team at Pydantic, uh, whom I work with the rest of the week, um, barring Fridays, uh, well, I think we're all planning to be at PyCon in May, so I would like to come. Uh, I haven't actually made it to PyCon US before, so I'd be really excited to be along and meet everybody um, as best I can find the time to do so. So yeah, the, the intention is to be at PyCon in May. Um, great. Yeah, <laughs> I, I expect so. I think uh, from what I remember on the PyCon website, it's about uh second week of feb or something that there was a suggested date where successful submissions would get notified so at this point i'm you know <laughs> not 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 feeling anything either way i shall just wait and see how things be come that date um great well um thank you everybody who joined the stream i think we've we've had um a fair few bits of questions and interactions as we've gone through today which has been quite a lot of fun for me um I think uh, there's probably still more to look into on this topic. We went through these APIs that are in, in uh, Peter and Victor's eyes very private today with these pi underscore or underscore pi prefixes. But um, if we've got, there's probably more stuff that we could look at. I don't know whether I'll finish that off off stream or might come back to that next week. I, I've got uh, lots of bits and pieces to do with Pyo3's up and coming future API. Um, and also if you're interested in helping get that uh, upcoming API out the door, then uh, there's lots of comments on the Pyo3 uh, GitHub. I think we've got a, we've got a, stick, a pinned issue which talks about it. We've also got a tracking issue of what's left. Uh, if you're interested in either helping me do any of the implementation or review any of that implementation, then that's definitely very welcome. Um, you can comment on GitHub and we can coordinate if you'd like to do that. Um, and also, yeah, if you've got any topics that you'd like me to particularly cover in future streams or feedback on how this stream went, um, what you'd like the format to change like, obviously one thing that I need to remember to do better next week is to switch between the browser and the terminal so that you can see what I'm actually looking at. Um, I'm sure I'll get better at that as these streams go on. Otherwise, thank you very much everybody for joining me today. It's been good fun again. Um, cool, and I'll wrap the stream up there.